The CIA retired its fastest airplane after it outran six missiles over Hanoi. That's not a contradiction. It's the strategy. We'll show how Operation Black Shield validated the A-12's edge at 84,000 feet and Mach 3 plus, then forced a rethink when every one of those SAMs guided absolutely perfectly. The payoff, understanding why policymakers chose bigger SR-71s than satellites and expendable drones, even as ox carts kept returning high value imagery from Southeast Asia. If the aircraft worked, why was it shelved? Because in a radar saturated war, speed bought time, not safety and budgets don't fund miracles twice. Before we move on, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and like the video. Most viewers know the Air Force's SR-71, but the CIA's A-12 arrived first, flew higher and faster, and then vanished into storage while still performing. The obvious question is why a platform built to outpace threats was pushed aside just as those threats matured. The inflection point was May 1960. A U-2 fell to a Soviet S-75, and that single loss hardened a procurement requirement Washington could not ignore. Overfly defended space and survive. Lockheed Skunk Works took the brief and produced Oxcart, a single-seat aircraft that shrank the target and pushed the flight regime past the reach of the first missile volleys. It was therefore a direct answer to a narrow problem. Get across the belt, get the film, and get out. The mandate pulled in two directions. Stay off radar until the last practical moment. And if you light up, leave the envelope before any interceptor or missile can reach a firing solution. Early 1960s radars improved range and discrimination, and the S-75 family gained better guidance and fuses. Budgets and metallurgy moved slower than those threat curves, so the design had to accept trade-offs and live with them. The brief locked in a compact plan form and a small radar cross-section relative to the later Blackbird. The crew count was one. The structure leaned heavily on titanium to tolerate skin temperatures generated by sustained Mach 3 crews. Chinese along the forebody added lift and helped with directional stability at high angle of attack, and two Pratt and Whitney J-58s provided the specific thrust and bleed management needed for long-duration crews above 80,000 feet. Radar management came from geometry first. Planform alignment kept edges and panels parallel, so returns would concentrate away from the threat. The inlet spike and cowl lip were shaped to suppress corner reflections while still feeding the engine shock system. Coatings with iron-based particles reduced specific frequency returns, but they were mitigation, not invisibility, and they carried weight and maintenance penalties. Operations assumed brief exposure, forward basing at Kadena shortened transit, and film return cycles were tuned for strategic targets in Asia, where a single pass could shift a targeting order. That profile meant the airplane did not loiter. It spiked in, hit the route exactly, and left the defended sector before crews on the ground could cycle through a second engagement. Compared to the U-2, which was slow and high but increasingly trackable, Oxcart traded endurance for dash. It accepted sustained thermal stress, fuel system complexity, and intensive ground support as the price of surviving radar-guided missiles that had already proven they could kill a glider-like spy plane. So on paper, the overflight problem had a solution. The aircraft narrowed the detection window and cut the engagement timeline, like sprinting through rain rather than waiting for the storm to pass. The wet comes either way, but less of it hits you. The unresolved piece was contact with actual Soviet design systems in Vietnam and North Korea, where the geometry, the guidance, and the human factor would decide whether speed truly kept the jet ahead of the envelope. The CIA built it because post-1960 missiles erased the U-2's margin over hardened targets. Having established why Oxcart existed, we can now move on to the sorties that proved both its capability and its limits. If the A-12 could outrun anything on paper, Black Shield proved that real missions still looked like controlled crises. The detachment at Kadena put the aircraft over Vietnam, North Korea, and Cambodia from mid-1967 into early 1968, and every route was built around the same premise. Compress exposure, accept detection, and leave before the second shot. It was therefore a test of whether speed could trim the risk to an acceptable slice rather than erase it. The warning problem never disappeared. Early warning sites could see the jet long before it crossed defended nodes, and Fansong radars had enough energy and precision to hand off guidance to S-75 batteries. Interception windows were short but not zero, and that small window drove everything from navigation tolerances to throttle technique, since even a minor deviation could increase time inside the lethal geometry. On October 30th, 1967, 
CIA pilot Dennis Sullivan crossed Hanoi at roughly 84,000 feet, fast enough that the cockpit ran hot from skin friction alone. He reported warning lights spiking as the radars tracked and locked. In any case, the aircraft stayed on route because the mission required a straight pass to satisfy camera footprints. And even a subtle turn costs altitude and speed when the airframe is already heat-soaked. Six S-75s came up. The contrails rose in narrow spears, and the missiles carried proximity-fused warheads designed to burst when the return reached a set threshold, so a direct hit was unnecessary. In thinner air, fragments fly farther and retain velocity longer, which enlarged the effective danger volume around the flight path. So, with that anticlimax, the defense did not need precision down to feet. It needed proximity within a blast radius measured in tens of meters. High closing speed helped and hurt. It shrank the time the fan song had to refine track quality, but it also reduced the pilot's options because the jet could not pull high G turns without departing its optimized cruise condition. Missile kinematics versus sustained Mach 3 crews became a math problem you solved in seconds, and proximity fuses punished late reactions even when altitude and speed looked comforting on paper. Post-flight inspection told the truth. Technicians found fragments embedded under the left wing, close to a fuel tank bay. That single detail confirmed both survival and vulnerability. The envelope had been breached by the blast cloud even though the airframe never took a direct hit, and the evidence lived in scored metal rather than speculation about how close the missiles had passed. Sullivan later said, Every one of those SAMS guided absolutely perfectly. That line was the point. The A-12's edge reduced exposure, but not to zero. Survival became statistical. One route, one day, with a handful of launchers and a narrow timing margin. And you either lived inside the tolerance, or you did not. How many SAMS that day? Six. Across Black Shield, multiple launches remained normal, which reinforced that risk never fell away. It just stayed compressed. Why the fragments near the tank? Proximity-fused warheads and fragmentation patterns produced a blast envelope that reached the airframe. If the aircraft worked, the next question is why it left service while still bringing home hard targets. Why retire the fastest plane while it was still delivering? Because the reconnaissance problem had widened beyond a single high-speed pass, and the niche that favored Oxcart had narrowed. By late 1967, decision-makers were measuring risk per sortie against a growing menu of alternatives that could meet collection needs without flying through the heart of a modern air defense grid. The lineup now included the Air Force's SR-71, satellites that no longer felt experimental, and unmanned options that could be lost without a pilot on the evening news. It was therefore a comparative exercise. Which system gathered the right data often enough at a tolerable political cost? And could the United States keep buying it, operating it, and explaining it when something went wrong? Running two parallel fleets imposed friction everywhere. The CIA's A-12 remained smaller, covert, and narrowly tasked, while the SR-71 brought greater payload and sensor flexibility and could integrate with a larger logistics backbone. You got overlap in airframes, engines, and materials, but duplication in training pipelines, spares, contractor support, and command chains. If you sum all of that up, the result is inefficiency you pay for twice. On capability, the SR-71's advantage was breadth. More sensors, more modular bays, a support ecosystem built to scale, the A-12 held a small edge in raw speed and weight, but its mission set stayed tighter, and its employment more constrained by secrecy rules and access. In any case, the question turned from, can it go fast enough, to, does it collect enough types of data in a single run to justify the risk? Threat trends moved against manned overflight, surface-to-air missile lethality improved, radar coverage stitched gaps, and queuing networks shortened reaction chains. Speed still mattered, but each increment bought less safety, and the payoff shifted towards standoff collection from outside the belt and persistent coverage from space. It was like using a scalpel when the clinic now needed a suite of instruments. Policy mood shifted as well. Early wins, mapping SAM sites, confirming target sets, proved the aircraft's utility, but near misses concentrated minds on the consequences of a loss. Leaders did not need a failure to feel the political cost curve. A close call could trigger diplomatic fallout, and authorizations for repeat overflights became harder to secure even when targets justified them. The economic logic was blunt. Two specialized titanium fleets strained budgets. 
consolidating around the SR-71 simplified training, logistics, and political accountability, and it aligned with broader strategic goals as the SR-71 was deemed superior. Within LBJ-era deliberations, useful imagery did not guarantee continued overflight authority. A single incident could upend wider policy, so the safer route was to centralize around the Air Force asset and accelerate space-based reconnaissance. The CIA's A-12 went quiet, not because it failed, but because it demonstrated the limit line. Speed preserved options briefly, while the strategic future favored the SR-71's broader utility and satellites' lower political risk, which leaves a final insight. Its legacy lives in how requirements changed, not in the airspeed readout.